This is the first video lecture for CS5804, Introduction to Artificial Intelligence. Uh, in this video, we'll be talking about how to organize our thoughts on what makes artificially intelligent programs more or less intelligent. So let's first touch base with the new Oxford American Dictionary. It says that AI is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and translation between languages. So what do we mean when we think about computer systems or programs tackling tasks that require human level intelligence? It's a really tricky concept to pin down once we try to be formal about it. Uh, it's easy to look at our fellow humans and see that they're intelligent, and most would argue that it's easy to look at advanced animals and see that they're intelligent. But things get pretty tricky when we try to look at electronic or even mechanical systems that, that might exhibit some intelligent behavior. At the far end of the spectrum, the, the easy end, we've seen some ad amazing advances in AI in the past few years. Um, things like Google's self-driving car prototypes and, and IBM's Watson are prime examples of computer systems that address tasks that clearly require human-level intelligence. But there's examples of, of simpler systems that are, are pretty undeniably instances of, of artificial intelligence. Things like search engines or game playing programs or, or even compilers, if you think about it. One example I really like thinking about is the old fashioned thermostat. These old thermostats regulate room temperature with a thermometer that triggers a mechanical switch when the thermometer passes a certain point. So it's not even a computer, really. But to me, it's, it's something that should qualify as a basic artificial intelligence. Right? You can imagine that before someone invented this machine, this could have been somebody's job. You would have paid somebody to do this, right? to turn on the furnace if the house got too cold. And now there's modern thermostats that take the same basic idea and improve on it with, with more sophisticated AI. So to me, it's hard to say that the original basic thermostat, that concept, isn't an example of simple AI when these new thermostats clearly are. So. One way to think about how we categorize AI systems is to differentiate between what is a task environment that requires intelligence and, and the actual supposedly intelligent system. Uh, we'll refer to these two things as the environment and the agent. Uh, the term agent is uh, it's AI terminology for the program or system that will act in the environment. So the thermostat's environment is the house, the controls for heating and cooling systems, and the thermometers, the thermometer sensor, uh, and the you know thermometer uh, or the Nest Learning thermostat, for example, is one type of agent, um, as is the old-fashioned mechanical thermostat. Right? And so it's useful to isolate our thoughts on each of these components since they can vary independently on how much and what type of intelligence is required for the tasks and how much and what type of intelligence is actually in the agent. So uh, Norvig and Russell use what they call the P's description to characterize task environments. So P's stands for the uh, first letter is performance measure, uh, environment, actuators, and sensors. Uh, so the performance measure represents the goal of the task. In other words, what criteria will indicate that we are successfully accomplishing the task or tasks? In the thermostat example, one possible performance measure is the comfort of the people living in the house. Right? The environment, the E, environment, refers to the actual setting the agent has to operate in. For example, the thermostat operates in a house, which is maybe in Blacksburg, in the Appalachian Mountains, you know, so it gets cold and it's at high altitude. The, the actuators are the outputs of the agent program, or, or what actions it can take. So in this case, in the, in the thermostat example, it's able to turn the heat on and off, maybe it has uh, variable fan speeds and so on. Finally, the sensors are the inputs to the agent program, i.e., you know, what measurements and data it has access to when it makes its decisions. A thermostat can you know, sense the ambient temperature, or maybe it has multiple thermometers for the indoor and outdoor temperature. Uh, it might have a barometer or a humidity sensor. Okay, and then one important idea is that the sensors might differ from the environment. For example, you know, even though we identified that the thermostat might be operating in Blacksburg, the agent might have no direct way of knowing 
that information since its sensors don't include a GPS. Environments also have a few attributes that are useful to think about. First is uh, one that we just talked about, right? The, the observability, which is just the concept of how much information in, in the environment is available to the agent. Second is how many AIs will be operating in the environment? You know, will it be a single agent or have multiple agents? Will the agents be cooperating or competing? Third is whether the environment is deterministic or stochastic, uh, whether there is any randomness in or chance involved in what happens when an agent takes actions. Fourth, environments can be episodic or sequential, whether past actions and decisions will affect future environments. You know, in some sense, most environments are actually sequential because there's some consequence to each action. Uh, but some of them reset every now and then, uh, so they're more episodic in that sense. Uh, you know, for example, if your AI is playing multiple games of checkers, it's pretty much episodic, but within each game of checkers, it's, it's uh, sequential. Uh, fifth is whether an environment is static or dynamic, or whether there are moving parts in the environment, right, We're making it dynamic, or whether things are time sensitive, which is also dynamic. Or if you just, you know, you take a single move, uh, one at a time, in which case it's, it's pretty much static. Okay, and lastly, environments can be discrete or continuous, meaning the actions available to the AI may be countable units like on a chessboard, uh, or they could be continuous values like distances or angles if you're moving a robot in the real world. In the next class, we'll, we'll go through examples um, a few example environments and tasks to think about these descriptors. So for now, what do you think? What is the performance measure for you know, a self-driving car? What's its environment? What are its actuators and sensors? In the environment, what does the agent get to observe? And so on. So the first example, like I just hinted at, is the automatic car driver. Right? Most of you have probably heard about Google's self-driving car project. They've been building these prototypes and actively testing them on the roads in California. It's, it's pretty amazing stuff. And, and you know, the rumors are that, that they've never been pulled over, they never had an accident, or they had one accident, but it was caused by the human controller, not the robot. Um, but it's definitely a, like a prime example of complex AI. And let's think about the environment that it lives in. The second example is a Jeopardy playing AI. Uh, and you might remember this. Uh, this was all over the news in 2011 when IBM put put its AI up against Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter, who were, were champion Jeopardy players. And it was able to win in a, a two-day match that uh, was a really fun uh, pair of episodes of Jeopardy to watch. The third example is one we're probably all familiar with. Most of us have played against uh, computer chess AIs. Um, and you might have read or remember that, that IBM famously beat Gary Kasparov in the 90s with his chess AI called Deep Blue, and since then it's become pretty much uh, no contest between humans and computers. Any computer nowadays can, can pretty readily beat grandmasters, human grandmasters at chess. Finally, we'll brainstorm about the environment for robot vacuums, like this uh, Roomba here. Uh, which is you know, advertised as a robot that should automatically clean up your house uh, and it should charge itself. Um, but you know, if any of you happen to own a Roomba, I bought one a few years ago and it's useful, but it doesn't really accomplish its job. But it is an interesting AI problem to think about. Okay, but that was just the first piece of the whole picture. Right? We've gotten over concepts to help characterize environments and tasks. But now we need ways to think about the intelligences behind the agents we can design. Norvig and Russell give a nice classification of these agents. Okay, so they give, they give five different types of agents. The simplest is a reflex agent, which decides on its actions directly based on what it's currently sensing. This is the dumbest type of agent, but it can actually do very well on a lot of different tasks. Okay. For example, you know, you can think about a vacuum that activates suction if it detects dirt. Okay, the second is a model-based agent, which stores some form of representation of the world. Right? So a model-based vacuum 
uh, AI could store something like the 3D rec representation of a room. It could store a map of what areas it's already cleaned, um, and so on. Okay, the third type of agent is a goal-based agent, which, which goal-based goal agents have uh, some state in the world, or many states in the world, that the AI tries to reach. It tries to manipulate the world to get to that, that state. And, and this is a step up from re reflex and model agents because goal-based agents uh, have some notion of success, whereas the other earlier types just sort of react to inputs or the combination of inputs to in a model. Right, so but goals, uh, you know, give the AI some a little bit more intelligence because it knows when it succeeded. So a goal-based vacuum could be one that tries to reach the state where the entire floor has been has been vacuumed at least once. But goals are often not enough, right? We also also need some notion of how close you are to the goal. And so the next type of agent is the utility-based agent, uh, and and what that means is. Uh, utility-based agent will have a utility function, a score function, that looks at the current environment, the current state of the world, and decides how happy should I be in this state, uh, or how much reward should I get for this. Now, if you reach a goal state, you should get a lot of reward. But if you get close to a goal state, you should probably get a good amount of reward too. And, and if you're really far away, you should have very little reward or very little utility. Um, and so this, this sort of produces a landscape of utility um, that can help the AI find the path toward the goal better. Okay, and then the last type of agent we're going to talk about is the learning agent, a learning agent, uh, which is able to adapt to previous experience and to other data. Right? It, it might do this by adapting its utility function or by improving its model or changing its goal. But the key is that it's able to do this, uh, do these changes during its life cycle. So again, let's think about you know what are the different types of agents that we could imagine looking at uh, operating in the self-driving car environment, or the types of agents that uh, could do well at a, a game like Jeopardy, or a game like chess, or again could do well as a robot vacuum. So in this video, we looked at some basic concepts for organizing how to think about artificial intelligence programs by isolating description of AI task environments from the attributes of the agents. I showed you Norvig and Russell's P's description for environments, and I went over a few other attributes we should consider when thinking about environments. Uh, then I quickly went over different types of agents we'll think about during the course. Uh, this would, this, these were reflex agents, model-based agents, uh, goal-based agents, utility-based agents, and learning agents. Okay, so try to think about the four example AI settings I showed you driving, jeopardy, chess, and vacuuming, and how you would characterize their corresponding environments. Uh, then think about what types of agents would make sense in these settings. We'll discuss your thoughts on these at the beginning of next class. In the next video, we're going to start to look at the first type of agent we're going to be studying in this class called search agents. Um, and uh, we'll see you over there.